Uh, so like cover to cover? Oh yeah, like it took me about an hour. Um, Fuck me. I, I, I did it after the uh, Apple stuff, so not not really kind of you know to the level of you know, where I sort of take a test on it, but I'm just you know reminding myself of how it was different. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I I didn't hit the record button just in time. Could you just restate for the audience what you would spent your evening's hour on? Uh, rereading Tex Murphy and the Tesla Effect. It took me about, uh, I don't know, just a bit under, about, bit under an hour. You are a speed reader. Some yes. might, some might <laughs> say a speed demon. <laughs> I, I read fast, but it, it's okay when it's a book I've, I've read before, you know, it's, it's fine. There's that. Uh, I have not read the Tesla Effect, and something you have urged me to do on many occasions. and uh, At least one. At least once. Several. And, and I will get around to it at some point. I just have to pick it up and have time to sit down and read it. Uh, have not had the opportunity to do so. In fact, no, the last... Too busy insult fighting. <laughs> yes, that as well. The last Tex Murphy book I read was Under a Killing Moon, which uh, which is, I, I think, mirrored for your pleasure on your end, but uh, it, it should is? be... Yes. Um, this uh, is, is my original copy of Under a Killing Moon. It is not doing well. No. It's uh, it's been out in it, it's it's had a bit of a dip. <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of similar to my copy of Pandora Directive, which uh, to we to we say d discovered what damp does to a book. Oh no! Oh, oh, and I thought it was in one piece, but it just came apart in my hands. Yeah. Uh, again, again, like my copy of Pandora, it just the pages just stream out of it. Dang. Well, it is uh, it is readable. It is mostly intact. Uh, all the text is legible, so I could technically, if I don't inhale too hard, I could sit down and read through it. Text uh, Murphy, the case of the black mold. <laughs> yes. In fact, I'm a little, a little like skeeved out handling it. Also, because some of the uh, mold just went away as I was thumbing through it. So Ooh. that's that's now on my hands. Uh, anyway. Um, as a novelization, I'm, I'm, I'm starting with this one because even though it's, uh, it's technically the second in the series, like on the title page, it says uh, th that there's already a novel of the Pandora Directive, and there is. Uh, it is the first game in the series to be novelized. So I thought we'd start here mm. for, the, for the kids. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, so, for those of you at home who don't know this, uh, the way that Aaron Connors, who came aboard to write the Tex Murphy games uh, mm. around an un Under a Killing Moon, thereabouts anyway, he, he wrote the script for this game at least. The way he designs games, and you can uh, interject if I'm getting this wrong, uh, the way he designs games is he sits down and writes a novel of it, and then decides there could be a game in there. I'm not... Sure, it's kind of a bit confusing when you look at the different uh, books. They've all kind of got a slightly different origins. But if I remember correctly, Under a Killing Moon um, was largely him putting in the stuff which got cut from the game. Um, there were a lot of like, like individual sequences. And then when you get up to Tesla Effect, it says that it's based on the novel, but I actually think the novel came like mid-development. They sort of started with the story. Um, again, I might be I might be mistaken about that. I'm not exactly a you know a Connor's scholar, um, <laughs> but it, it, it's certainly a, a bit kind of in the middle. You know, which came first in each case. Yeah, it's a bit chicken and egg thing. I I, I see what you mean about uh, putting stuff in that got cut from the game because. As far as differences from the game, uh, the most glaringly obvious is that the Moonchild actually has passengers on it and not just floating mm. cubes. And there's a whole load uh, more stuff in GRS, if I remember correctly. It, it's been a very long time since I read Under a Killing Moon. Oh, uh, but I, see, but I, but I seem to remember that there's a lot more about um, the person on the inside who in the game is just really a, like a, a, a lore dumpy kind of computer terminal. Um, yeah, that's right. I think GRS is still abandoned in the uh, novel. Uh, I, I, I do remember that once you get to uh, the moon child, you know, he runs, he wakes up Ava, as mm. he does in the game, but then Ava has a shit ton more to do. And, yeah. and uh, in, 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 in the game, she pretty, you pretty much wake her up and it's like, I'll meet you in the ending. Yeah, um, something like that. She's a bit more of a character. I, mean, I think one, one of the, the big differences between the books and the games is um, the amount that sort of secondary characters get to do. Yes. And, you know, because obviously the game sort of tends to do um, a few fairly consistent things, like the, they'll, they'll put you into a big location and have you do a scavenger hunt, yes. whereas the books will tend to put a character there and just kind of get to the point. 
Um, I mean, skipping ahead a little bit to Pandora, just because the first example that came to mind. Um, in um, the game, when you go and speak to Elijah Witt, uh, in the game, you basically sort of trick him out of his apartment with a big cry of dad. Um, <laughs> and then dad. You, kind of, you, you kind of sort of sneak around it while he's away. Whereas in the book version, Tex just straight up meets him and has a sexy uh, encounter with his niece, Basha, <laughs> uh, who just happens to be standing around on the towel in one of those scenes, which I wasn't quite sure if Connors wanted that in the game. They just didn't have the guts to ask someone or it was sort of added a bit, you know, later. Didn't have the guts to ask one. Well, there is the, um, oh shit, what's her name? Uh, the Colonel's Squeeze. Oh, blank English answer? No, 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 the other one. The uh, uh, one who oh. wants the birthday card. Damn, it's on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, if if they could, Milan Toad, I just oh Milan Toad, of course. Yeah. I just I just put, uh, sorry, like, like I said, it's been a long time since I played Under the Moon or read the book. <laughs> I flipped up to a random page, and there it was. Am I pointing them the right? Uh, yeah, yep, that's Milan, right. Some somewhere along those. Yeah. So, Jesus Christ! If they could get an actress to show up in in that garb, I'm sure they could have gotten uh, someone to. Uh... Didn't she also play um, Ariel in Tesla Effect? I, I know there is a returning character from Under a Killing Moon, yes, in Tesla Effect. I'm, I'm again. I'm blanking. I'm being a very bad expert on this stuff. But uh... <laughs> well, I called you in as as a as a as a person who appreciates <laughs> literature based on uh, on computer games, and I and and I and you're one of the few people I know who's actually read all of the Tex Murphy novels at some point. Um, <laughs> rounding out Under a Killing Moon. So let's let's get on to the Pandora Directive in a second. Rounding out Under a Killing Moon. Uh, the thing that stood out to me the most, and you're talking about. Um, Games putting you in a location versus the uh, novels giving you a character in terms of mm. plot dump and such. And the one thing that struck me about this was a very Gabriel Knight-ish moment where instead of reading it on a computer terminal about what the moon child and the prophecy and all this bullcrap is, he goes to see a professor with a large pipe who proceeds to explain it all to him as if he was a text document on a computer. I mean, I mean the... Um, the original textbooks are actually very similar to the Gabriel Knight novels. Um, the Gabriels um, are a lot closer uh, to their games, but they have kind of, sort of the same sort of writing style, really. Kind of walk through at, at bit, certain, yeah. a certain points, yeah. I mean, I'd say that Under, Under a Killing Moon is definitely, when I say the worst for that, I don't really mean it necessarily a bad way, but it's certainly, when you're reading it, it's very clear that you're reading through the story of a game. Whereas I think when you get to the Pandora Directive, it sort of starts to feel a bit more of its own, um, you know, literary thing. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, it doesn't help that, that you are come, um, again, which I, I love back in the day, I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to bag on it, does have a very simple, not that great story. Um, oh my God, your, yeah. your copy is... Yeah, that, that, it kind of made a funky sound. I'm not, oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> the pages are stuck together and not in a fun way. Not in the fun way, no. This is alive. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it is a relatively simple story, but most of um, Under Killing Moon doesn't actually have anything to do with the story. It's like it's, it's a lot of sort of side quests. And then you basically just sort of told, oh, and by the way, this ancient prophecy, and now to space! <laughs> yes. Whereas, um, <laughs> again, Pandora is a much better structured um, story within the game, and that definitely kind of comes across uh, in the book version. Well, let's let's move on to the Pandora direct, because I think you actually do have a very good point. Uh, Under a Killing Moon was more of a game first, and then, you know, a novel second, because there are a lot of solitary passages where text is just pissing in a circle, uh, trying to work out what the next... So, there is a good plot to Under Killing Moon, but it's sort of in the background, and everything that Tex does is basically just being thrust into one shitty situation after another. Mm. Uh, the Pandora Directive, on the other hand, has actual characters in it. And I really like the Pandora Directive novel. It is um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm suddenly I'm going to say it's like, you know, the, the greatest noir fiction you'll ever read or anything. Um, <laughs> but it is a really nicely told adventure. It's got a lot of personality and it's got a lot of charm. I, what, I, what I've always really loved about the text games is the writing. When I say always, I mean, Mean Streets and Marshall Memorandum, not yes. so much. But like the, the, late, the later games. The Aaron um, Connors era. Exactly. Um, not not so much the era where they were making stuff like, you know, Amazon and Countdown. Um, but I've always loved the 
the sense of character, the sense of uh, community mm. uh, which Chandra Avenue has. And, and I think one of the nice things about the Pandora Directive novel is that it really gets to dig into those in a way that the games can't. The big example um, being Texas Friendship with Louis. Yes. Which in the, in the, ga- in the games, it's, it's always been there. But it's sort of a like background thing, like like Tex will sort of say, "Ah, oh, Louis's my best friend," but you only really go and speak to him for clues. Whereas yes. in the novel, uh, there's much more of you know, like Tex crashing out at his place. There's Louis cutting him slack with his bills and kind of helping him out directly. Yes. There's much more of this sort of sense of friendship. There's and even that- a glorious scene where uh, Louis serves him a batch of chili, and there's like a half-page, lovely description of how Texas yeah. alra- always relished the prairie fire that explodes across the <laughs> roof of his mouth. It, it's, it goes on for like half a page, and, and it's just really nicely done. Yeah, there's know? this warm connection between these two. And I think, and I think it kind of goes for most of the other characters as well. I mean, Rook doesn't really get a whole lot of a. a as um, I don't know. Rook doesn't get a whole lot of appearance in it, but when dealing with characters like Regan, uh, who's the sort of femme fatale character, again, she gets to be a lot more interesting in the novel because you aren't just sort of seeing for like a couple of you know cutscenes they could get Tanya Robertson for. Um, it's <laughs> with a lot more uh, banter and sort of uh, slightly sort of saucy talk between them, and it just genuinely you know has much more of that kind of sort of noir feel. And a lot more because Regan in the game, uh, as as well as as she was played, uh, did sort of come across as the "Hi, I have tits" person. And kind of. And 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 in the novel, she's a lot more rounded out. Tex actually has a genuine attraction to her, not just because of the memory department, but actually because you know. I mean, I'd say mechanically as well that in yes. the game, she's one of like two optional romances. And wow, yes. will we get to that when we get to Tesla. But in, <laughs> whereas in the, the, the novel, um, she kind of sort of can play that sort of temptress kind of character, even though the focus of the game is still on Chelsea. Yes. And so it makes a lot of the time when Tex is, um, you know, manfully resisting temptation just feel a lot more appropriate. And right. just, just, in, just in general, the, the story of the Pandora Directive is so much better than Under a Killing Moon. I mean, it's a really well told game. And I love, I really like a lot of the stuff which the, which the book does from it. If I'd say the worst bits of the book are the bits which are closest to the game. Um, and, and I love the Pandora Directive. But think, for example, um, when you go to uh, Roswell in the game, it's all abandoned and it's deserted and there's just like kind of a green cloud monster floating around. And mm. it, it's atmospheric, but it's not that exciting yet, once you've kind of got over the initial oomph of it. Whereas in the. Speak for uh, yourself. Well, after a while, after a while, it's sort of it, okay. I get killed by the green, the green uh, cloud of flatulence. Right. Uh, whereas in the in the book version, um, Tex basically goes there. And there's a couple of guards there, and he, he pulls rank on them with a stolen NSA card. Yes. And you know, it has a bit more of a sort of sense of that living world, rather than you know now we're into another uh, Tex Murphy scavenger hunt. It's interesting and- you bring up Roswell because that is actually my favorite bit of the novelization. It does something that the game doesn't, as you say fart cloud uh, you're on a timer basically and once you deal with the fart cloud you're on your own and you can just piss around the complex all you like um interestingly first of all the novel that i have is <laughs> thankfully mold free but also comes in pieces it's the first episodic game it's the first episodic and and strangely enough it comes in in like uh, two splits pieces uh and page 222 is sort of orphaned it was the one that sandwiched between where where it split and page 222 is actually the page where uh tex escapes from roswell and what happens in in the in the novel as opposed to the game spoilers is that uh as opposed to dealing with the fart cloud first and then getting to the spaceship getting the power cell and getting the hell out of there what happens is he pisses around for an hour gets to the spaceship and suddenly all the mummified corpses lurch come alive and spew this fart cloud out of their mouths (laughs) he scampers for the elevator barely makes it to the top runs over to this guardhouse which has two guards in it as you say they're not in the game and shouts the phrase that's on page 222 which is my favorite quote of the entire novel he runs in there and says i want you to go lock that vault door destroy the key and then put the complex into a deep freeze and if anyone ever comes here again i don't care who it is i don't care if it's a damn precedent and they want to go underground you have orders direct from the nsa to blow their stupid brains out 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that there's also some nice stuff around then in that because it's not tied to the game's um, seven or so kind of day schedule, he mm-hmm. gets to do like a few more kind of uh, PI things around the side. Like, like when he flies out to Roswell, you know, it's a really long trip. You know, he sort of stops off in places and, you know, has has lunch and, you know, comes to continues his flight. It just adds a nice sort of sense of texture to the world. Oh yeah, even, um, even the whole bit about finding the box that the Black Arrow Killer steals from mm. Lucy, who by the way is not named Lucy Love, he's named Lucy Lust, which they can't apparently get away with in a novel. Um, <laughs> there's actually a bit of detective work instead of pissing around in a sewer for 45 minutes with a thing that goes beep. Mm. But I do think that one of the nice things about it is that it still has, even though it, it sort of deviates from kind of the game design lot, it still maintains the voice. I can yes. totally hear Chris Jones reading this entire book. Yes, um, and, and I think that, he should. And, and, I, I, think, I would love that. And I think that's what really makes um, all of the books you know, successful, that they have that voice, they have that sense of identity, and it really kind of plays to some of the stuff which the game can't do. Um, either because it's got to focus, it's got to offer puzzles, um, or it's got to be something like Roswell, which is going to be huge. And clearly, they had to get their money's worth out of those sets. And so, <laughs> you kind a bit. It's sort of one of the, the flaws of the series. You do kind of spend a lot of time on your own in basically empty locations, whereas the book could just kind of go. And then I got the thing, and then I was gone. Yes, and uh, Pandora Directive also wins on a number of occasions as one of the uh, pr- uh, probably the best Tex Murphy adventure game, precisely because Hands, hands down. Hands down. Because there's so much. Well, we we haven't played Poison Pawn yet, but there's so much conversation, and the and conversations actually mean something. I know they tried to replicate that in Tesla Effect, but mm. they didn't do it quite as successfully. Pandora has a shit ton of conversations, and they're all meaningful. Uh, instantly, before we skip ahead to uh, uh, Tesla Effect. Uh, uh, I just thought it would it would be interesting to uh, spoil for everyone what the canonical ending to the Pandora Directive is, because the game touts seven different endings, and I don't know wh- which ending did you get the first time you played the game. I, I think pretty much everyone gets the same ending the first time they play. Right. Um, that's uh, Lombard Street, isn't it? The the middle the middle yeah, ground. The middle ground. Yeah. Um, mo- mostly because you have to be an absolute dick to get Boulevard of Broken Dreams. And Mission Street is, is basically reliant on one conversation, uh, which unless your trolls is, you know, stream followers, you aren't <laughs> going to get by accident. <laughs> no. And it's tricky because one of the one of the Mission Street endings kind of resembles a Lombard Street ending, and then there's a super, super hard to get Mission hmm. Street ending, which involves... Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so the, uh, interestingly, the canonical ending of the novel is, in fact, the one that everyone gets. It is the holiday ending, where Chelsea runs off with a hologram of Cary Grant and a pint of haagen And I think one, one thing which I, I just add to that one is that in the game, that's presented as kind of a failure. Mm. Uh, because Tex has been chasing Chelsea throughout the, the whole thing, and then kind of you finally get to the end, it's like, no, no good ending for you. Whereas in the book, it feels appropriate to his character. Yes. Um, you know, he, he's, un, he's, he's unlucky. Yeah, he's unlucky. Um, he doesn't, you know, walk out of things, you know, getting the money and the girl and all of that kind of stuff. It, it feels more like a, like a, a happy ending. Yeah, um, and it's, but, it's know, also it, not... it, it, everything, everything's back to normal and like another adventure will be coming on its way. Yeah. Uh, and he still has a chance. But that chance is not going to be today. Exactly. That was what I was getting at. It's not as much of a closed door as the game makes it out to be, because the game sort of makes it out to be, well, well, you sort of failed on that one, didn't you? You will now remain alone for the rest of your life. And the, the novel doesn't frame it like that. It just frames it as Chelsea needs a break and goes home with a hologram, presumably to do whatever you can do with a hologram that does not involve physical contact. 